I've conducted over 200 investigations of employee misconduct, so I'm no stranger to workplace violence. You probably aren't either. In the 1990s, the word going postal entered our vocabulary after several workplace shootings happened at post offices between 1986 and 1993. In 2016, there were 500 workplace homicides, with 80% of them involving a gun. In today's episode, though, we'll explore a case where an employee found a much sneakier way to get revenge on his co-workers. The city of Schloss Alt Stuckenbrock is one of the oldest in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany. In 2004, it celebrated its 850th birthday. Its 27,000 residents are familiar with the history of the area, including Stalag 326, a German prisoner of war camp during World War II that housed mostly Soviet soldiers. There is still an exhibit dedicated to it in the local police training institute where the camp was once located. There is also a monument to the 36 mass graves of Soviet, French, Italian, and police prisoners of war. In 2018, however, the citizens of this small town came face to face with another horror. A 26-year-old employee of the local metal fittings factory, ARI Armaturin, noticed a white powder on a sandwich he packed for lunch. He thought this was odd, but didn't find it particularly frightening. He assumed it had gotten on his sandwich accidentally. However, when he noticed the same powder on his sandwich in the break room the following day, he became suspicious. It was too much to believe he'd accidentally contaminated his lunch in the exact same way two days in a row. Something was not right. The employee took his sandwich to company management and explained the situation. In May 2018, after mulling it over, managers decided to install a secret camera in the break room to see if they could discover what was going on. When they reviewed the surveillance footage, they were stunned. It clearly showed 57-year-old Klaus O, a 38-year company employee, taking food out of his co-workers lunch bags, dusting them with an unknown substance, and carefully repackaging the items and putting them back where he had found them. What they were seeing made absolutely no sense to the co-worker or to management. Why would Klaus put any substance on a co-worker's food? Was it some kind of prank? Klaus didn't seem like someone who would joke around. He was a competent locksmith who was meticulous in his professional duties. He was a quiet man who tended to wear headphones while working and kept to himself. His manager once described him as conspicuously inconspicuous. Still, the fact that he didn't socialize with others didn't mean he didn't get along with them. As far as anyone knew, he had never had a quarrel or disagreement with anyone at work. In fact, he was always helpful when a fellow employee needed some assistance. ARI managers called the police. When they searched Klaus' work bag, they discovered a small bottle of a powdery substance. They immediately sent it to the lab for testing. It was only when they searched Klaus' home, however, that the seriousness of what was going on came to light. In his basement, they found a makeshift chemistry lab with a host of toxic heavy metals, including lead acetate, cadmium, and mercury. His collection of substances was so toxic that a judge later called them more dangerous than all the combat agents in the Second World War. Testing by the Regional Criminal Office of North Rhine-Westphalia indicated the substance on the sandwich bread was toxic lead acetate, and there had been enough on it to cause severe organ damage. There could be no question now that the poisoning was intentional. Klaus was arrested. Other than asking his wife to get him a lawyer, he refused to say anything to his family or to police. Others, however, began talking. 
It had long been a mystery as to why between 2000 and 2018, 21 healthy ARI employees had suffered mysterious illnesses and died. Police now wondered if poisoning could have been the cause. Rather than exhume the bodies of the deceased, they started with three former employees who were sick but still alive. Two of them, it turned out, were suffering from severe kidney damage as a result of lead and cadmium exposure. Both of these victims still face a high risk of developing cancer. A third had suffered from irreversible brain damage and is a coma due to mercury poisoning. Klaus O. was charged with the attempted murder of all three. We still don't know exactly when his assaults began. It's possible that additional victims will be exhumed as the investigation continues. Family members of several deceased ARI employees have described the progression of their loved one's illnesses in ways that are consistent with heavy metal poisoning. Dizziness, shivering, numbness, paralysis, and stomach pains. Defense attorneys and prosecutors alike continue to search for clues as to Klaus O's motive. Employees at ARI are still trying to cope with the sense of shock and betrayal by discovering a murderer among them. As the lawyer of one of the sick employees said before the start of the trial, there was a relationship of trust as in any operation among colleagues. No one has expected anything like this. During five interviews a psychologist had with Klaus while awaiting trial, he talked about his workplace poisonings. During his testimony, the psychologist said that it seemed as if Klaus approached poisoning his colleagues in much the same way a researcher would view a lab rat or a guinea pig. It was an experiment. Klaus had no empathy or feeling for the victims or their families. He would choose a victim, prepare the toxins, and then methodically poison their food and drink during work hours. He would then curiously sit back and wait to see what would happen. No one, including Klaus O. himself, thought he was mentally ill, and no one offered any evidence that might reduce or soften his sentence. In November 2018, Klaus O. was found guilty of the attempted murder of all three of his co-workers. He was given the maximum sentence allowed by the law, life in prison. While life in Germany is generally equivalent to just 15 years behind bars, a forensic psychiatrist recommended preventive detention based on his opinion that even at age 72, when he is eligible to be released, he would remain a threat to society. Contrary to popular belief, workplace homicides have actually dropped over the last 20 years. But the circumstances of these crimes have also changed. In the 1990s and early 2000s, the majority of workplace homicides were a result of robbery. Companies understandably focused their violence prevention efforts on security measures that would make it harder for burglars to succeed. Today, though, more than half of workplace homicides occur over an interpersonal argument or argument over work performance, domestic violence spillover into the workplace, or a mass shooting, which makes it even more important for us to speak up if we're threatened by a coworker or observe aggressive or bizarre behavior. Or much more rarely, if we always feel sick after eating lunch kept in the company break room. Thank you for watching this episode of Unmasking a Murder. Please look for my upcoming segment on the personality profile of poisoners in our featured crime analysis section. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, I'd be thrilled if you'd consider it. And please tell your friends about us. And if there's a particular case you'd like us to cover, please let us know. Until next time, when we try to unmask another murderer.